Well, thank you very much. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming to the show. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much. I will need some help at the back to move the slides around. That's okay. Yep. Great. So, um, good. So, thanks for coming. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? So, good. So, what I want to do um, here today is uh, offer a critique of uh, something in the just war tradition to critique something that people, um, I, an assumption, I think, or a common position in the just war uh, field these days um, that is very widely shared in the sense to um, uh, try to argue that uh, the most widely shared view probably in the just war tradition is not one that people should share uh, anymore. We'll see how far I get with that. I, I'm very aware that the just war tradition is incredibly diverse. It's a, you know, east and west, a number of different <laughs> figures and so on. I'm going to focus in particular uh, to um, some uh, more recent debates and, uh, by political theorists, political philosophers, starting with Jeff McMahon and extending uh, beyond, including his critics, um, focusing on that dominant strand, this, this we could call it the, the new just war view. Um, and what this new just war view is, is looking at the justification of just war based on a certain view of self-defense. So what's, in a sense, unproblematic is that just war is a form of self-defense, a particular understanding of self-defense by this crowd. Uh, what is deeply controversial amongst them, where they are very divided, isn't that it's self-defense, but it's about the liability of the person doing the harm, whether or not we can retaliate against that, have self-defense or not, when that self-defense switches on or is, is off. But that self-defense at the heart of just war is not something that they uh, doubt. They all are wrapped around uh, that view. I'm going to argue that the model is flawed for uh, two reasons. One reason I'm not going to say much about is that I think it's a flawed analogy applying interpersonal relations to international relations. It goes far too, goes way too far. And talking about Albert and Betty, or Albert is hurting Betty, to then say that various wars are okay. I don't like that for lots of reasons, not just that Albert and Betty it could be Alberta and Brian or other things. But I'm going to be particularly focusing today on why I think that they are misunderstanding what self-defense is and how self-defense uh, works. So I'm going to go to the very heart. The one thing they all are agreed on is the one thing I'm going to say that we should uh, reject. In my conclusion, tentatively, is either that the dominant view of just war theory should be revised or that their view of self-defense is simply inapplicable. So that's, in a sense, where we're going to go today. Next slide, please, Maestro. <laughs> Thank you. Good. So I start with the, 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 the images of Helen Fro. <coughs> and so uh, in her review of, of our friend, uh, Dean Chatterjee, uh, fabulous book, Ethics of Preventative War, um, she says, the only view to which just war theorists are committed is that war can, at least in theory, sometimes be just. That claim is the essence of the just war project. To deny it seems to lead to either pacifism or realism. Beyond that starting point, there are no views to which just war theorists are committed in virtue of being just war theorists. And so, to restate a bit, this is the view again that to have a just war, that the war is justified. There is no wrong. It's good, even, under certain conditions. And that's the claim. And to deny it, she says, means either you think that no war uh, can happen, you'd be against it all, you'd be some type of pacifist, or you just think that war is just in the nature of how the world is. It's no different from birds can fly, grass is green, this kind of stuff. It's just a description of, of, of the world. I think that, that characterization of you are led to either pacifism or realism is false. And I'm going to challenge this notion of self-defense that war can be just in the way that Fro, McMahon, and company suggest. Next slide. So, what justifies a just war? There's lots of different reasons. I'm not going to go through them all, um, but I'm only going to highlight um, uh, these uh, two. The first, I'm not using the Latin, um, so forget, uh, apologies uh, for that. But the first is that the war would be necessary. This is the idea of a just cause. If there is no just cause to go for war, then there is no justified war. But having a just cause is not enough. It's in our trade. We call these things necessary but not sufficient conditions. 
Um, so you need more than just a just cause. One of the things that could form a just cause could be a kind of self-defense. So uh, uh, defense against an unjustified aggression would be one of the things that could count, but it's not the only thing uh, that might count as a just cause. It could be other types of, of, of bads or evils that could give rise to a just cause in, we'll call it the Western tradition of just war theory. The other is this idea of proportionality, that a just war should be proportionate. So if you have a just uh, cause to engage in some type of battle, it doesn't mean that, hey, that's great, you can now kill everyone who lives in the other country that's involved in uh, the uh, activity that gives just, you know, there's, there's a limit to how far you can go and how much you might uh, do. We must not only have a just cause, but we must also fight in a just way. For those who care, I don't know how many of those there are in the room, the uh, church fathers also had a long list of other good stuff. Uh, one of the ones that uh, Aquinas uh, uh, there on the right came up with was this idea that there also has to be a just government that's involved uh, in a just war. So it's not just enough to have a just cause and do it in a just way, it must also be a just government. That's a condition we don't hear too much. That meant to be godly, uh, you know, more or less. Uh, Christian nations were somehow okay for Aquinas, other ones were not. But I'm not so worried about that. I am interested in this necess necessary and proportionate conditions because, now to the next slide, these things, in a sense, come together with how I believe, um, we'll call it the new just war theories, plural, conceive of the justification of just war, bringing together the necessity and proportionality as a, you know, in, in light of war, just war, being a kind of self-defense. So a common example that um, all use, and by all I'm referring to a wide number of people, they are not only McMahon and Fro, they're also my uh, old friend, he used to be in the UK, Jonathan Kwong, down in the corner. We're going to come to you, Jonathan, in a minute. Um, the example of defense. And the defense example is a man happens across a villain, in this, I guess, pre-feminist formulation, man happens across a villain attacking an innocent victim. The only way to save the victim's life is to kill the villain. And so this is seen as a type of paradigm example of where self-defense uh, could uh, be uh, justified. Note that in this example, before we do any philosophical commentary, we know two things. One, that we are a third party. That we are looking at this. We are not the man. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, the happening, you know, oh, actually, in this case, we are the man. We're not the villain. We're not the victim. We're the passerby. We are a third party to this. I want to just kind of pause and flag that, thinking about self-defense that are acting in self-defense, and we're the third party, just to begin to highlight some of the moves that I want to make as to why their view of self-defense is one that we should be um, more critical of. The other is, of course, we act from a factual basis. It's not true or justified belief. That's not relevant uh, as a concern for me right now, um, but just another thing to note about that example. We don't have a doubt as to whether the vi villain is doing this and what the, vi what the villain's intentions are. Now what do we do when we, the passerby, walk past and see a villain, a terrible person, trying to kill somebody else? Yikes, that's horrible. Now, we're not imagining this kind of Good Samaritan law stuff. That's not worked into the hypothetical example that you have a legal obligation to kind of uh, help out if you, if you can. Jonathan Kwong notes, this is not just his view. This is, just, this is a view I would also say would be to McMahon, Pro, and others um, about defensive arm that you are liable to some defensive harm when you have forfeited your rights against the harm being imposed, and thus you are not wronged if the harm is imposed on you. And so in this example, the villain is liable to defensive harm, it's liable to being hurt, harmed by somebody else, and it's because the villain has forfeited his or her rights against the harm being imposed. Um, that's what's doing the work. So the self-defensive harm isn't, as it were, a right of a victim to be doing something as victim. It is instead a forfeited right of the villain uh, that is doing the work here. The villain no longer has a right not to be harmed by others, and that therefore justifies our harming the villain, potentially to stop the villain doing any further harm to the innocent victim. This rightness or wrongness of our act is not judged so much by what we do, but by what an 
by what another has done. It's what the villain does that triggers whether or not this self-defensive harm is it okay or not. It's not our individual mindset. It's not our immediate situation as such. I'll pause there. Hopefully the distinction is sinking in, even if people may not go to the same conclusions. Can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so now I come to the great man. That's supposed to be, thank you very much, it's supposed to be on the left, Michael Walzer, and on the right, Jeff McMahon with beard. Jeff McMahon goes between beard and non-bearded versions. Uh, I like both. I particularly like Jeff personally, um, which is why it almost pains me uh, to criticize his view, and I actually, for OUP, wrote one of the endorsements for the, the book uh, when it came out. So, um, so I recognize his philosophical contributions, even if I disagree with the core contribution. So what's fascinating here is that Jeff, quite rightly, has kind of initiated a, a kind of revolution, I think. I think that's not too strong a, a word to, a way to describe it. In thinking about the just war tradition, you had, on the one hand, Michael Walzer as the more um, the latest and greatest exponent of the so-called moral symmetry of combatants, this idea that in battle, the two sides, one might be absolutely, you know, could be Death Star, Darth Vader, Stormtrooper, evil. <coughs> the other can be uh, Jedi Knight, uh, good Ben Kenobi, this kind of Princess Leia, uh, uh, good. Um, but in the, in the heat of battle, that there's a kind of a state of nature, that there's a moral, um, a, a symmetry, a moral symmetry between the two, that there's no kind of right and wrongs, as it were, in either trying to defend themselves in this situation. And Joe McMahon has um, very forcefully convinced a, a number of people, and I think it is now the orthodox view, though when he, uh, when he came out with it not that long ago, um, an earlier work uh, prior to 2009, um, uh, uh, was very unorthodox when he first said it, um, has flipped this on his head. He's argued that combatants do not have a moral symmetry in battle. They, there is very much a moral asymmetry, that some can do the self-defending and some cannot do uh, defend themselves. So he notes here, a just cause is an aim that satisfies two conditions, that it may permissibly be pursued by means of war, and two, that the reason why this is so is at least in part that those against whom the war is fought have made themselves morally liable to military attack. Um, and again, we've got more permissibility is, is determined by what others do, that they have made themselves a certain way, that changes their status, that allows us to attack them. So imagine Darth Vader, Obi-Wan Kenobi kind of battle. So I'm going to hopefully uncontroversial, hypothetical, philosophical territory that people, well, may not, well some people have very strong views on, on one side, but usually not both. Um, in a situation like that, the thought is that the side of evil is the unjust aggressor. They're doing something harm. They have an unjustified type of, of, of harm, attack against others, however you might understand that, in the case of Darth Vader, in the face of just evil, apparently, and therefore has no right to defend himself. So those on that side, his army, does not have a right to defend itself. So in battle, they're an unjustified side. They have an unjustified aggression. And they've made themselves morally liable to military attack. That for Jeff McMahon, morally speaking, the evil army ought to not only uh, be deserters, and he claims that there's an obligation for soldiers to desert uh, the army to leave, but perhaps even to turn their own firepower on their own military uh, command, to, to break the command, it, it, because they are on an unjust aggressor side. And that those who are on the side of, of good, whatever that means, in this case, having a justified, uh, justified cause of doing self-defense here, they are allowed to defend themselves against this attack because the other side has made themselves morally liable to it. Note that in thinking this, flipping on its head through, several things happen. One, it's not centrally about my intentional state that's doing any work. So the fact that someone is attacking me or someone close by that they might say, feel duress. That is doing no work. That doesn't even seem to matter. That that person's life is in some type of emergency state. Doesn't <coughs> seem to matter at all. It's just that the other has done some type of unjustified action by which they have to some degree, 
forfeited their rights to our coming in or someone else coming in and doing something about it. As I noted, unjust combatants are liable to attack, but just combatants are not. So if uh, someone has made themselves liable to attack by being an aggressor, not only do they have no right to defend themselves, but there is also no right they do further wrong in trying to stop me in attacking them um, for the attack that they have initiated on this example. And we do no wrong here if justified, even if civilian casualties. Of course, we get into various things about the doctrine of double effect and other types of things, but the thought broadly is we have a just situation. This is, it's not only morally permissible that we can do this, it's also morally right. Um, so what we have on just aggressors, not only are they made themselves morally liable to attack, but on this account, we should be doing attacking. We should be doing stopping. We should be having a military confrontation against them for that reason. Even if we, us, the, the person walking by, is not the person actually under threat. It's just that we see someone else or some other group in this example as those who are under attack. Next, please. Okay, so this is supposed to be a picture up at the top corner of John Gardner, um, a professor of law at um, a professor of jurisprudence at Oxford. Um, and so now I come to some doubts about self-defense and how it's being understood here. And I start with John in part, because anyone who knows about John's biography, before he took <coughs> up, uh, before he succeeded Ronald Dworkin at University College Oxford, he was a criminal barrister. And he rightly looks at this and says, aha, there's a very big difference between how self-defense works and the normal ways that we understand self-defense from how it's working on, uh, how it works um, in, in other spheres. Although I don't believe here he's talking about McMahon and others in particular. But I apply some insights. One of them is this, that a permission is not a reason. It says that what we have moral reason to do is one question. What we're morally permitted to do is another. And he argues that the fact that we are permitted to do something is not a reason for doing that thing. We need some additional reason to justify some positive action. So it might be the case, strictly speaking, according to McMahon, I'm going to call them McMahon and Company. And note that McMahon and Company disagree on everything else. They disagree very much on what it takes to be liable for a self-defensive type of harm. They, they disagree very strongly on this, or at least they spill many, uh, a lot of ink trying to tell us how they disagree very strongly on that. But they don't disagree on this point about that someone is, more, is morally permitted, therefore it's something that we ought to do. And Gardner is reminding us that the fact that someone might be morally liable uh, to harm based on the action is not reason itself to then do any harm uh, to that person. There needs to be some extra reason, uh, whatever that reason uh, might be, uh, in, order to, um, in order to move forward. So I think that if they want to uh, make the argument that they do, using self-defense in, I think, a very unorthodox way that they are using it, they have to, they, they aren't done. Their work isn't finished in saying that it's therefore permissible. I'm liable to being harmed by others. Does it mean that I can or should be harmed uh, by others? We need another reason, right? Well, or, so I borrow from John. Next slide, please. Good, and so here's some further doubts about self-defense without pictures on the side that are cut off. So self-defense in our normal understanding, our normal usage, um, uh, I think not only in law, um, is that self-defense requires some type of emergency. The fact that someone will die unless an unjust attacker is harmed or killed is insufficient to warrant my harming or killing them, say, when I am not that someone who will die. Um, minus, again, any uh, Good Samaritan uh, laws that your country uh, might uh, have. That someone must be stopped may not require it is me um, that, that does it. Um, and so um, I want to then move, uh, move on to uh, think about a certain uh, couple cases to highlight the further point that if it's about the liability to be harmed or killed, usually linked to an emergency, necessity is, is understood by just for theorists. It need not demand immediacy. It doesn't demand the necessity justification we see in the model penal code. Where am I going here? Model Penal Code talks about sentencing. It was something developed and published in the United States for the first time in 1962. There's other versions that have come out later. And it meant to have a kind of a, a unified 
uh, criminal code and also a, a, a more or less unified uh, view of sentencing code for the American states, the federal government, and others. The reason was simple. There's 50 states and then other jurisdictions, and all of them had slightly different tweaks on what a theft was, what murder was, what counted for this, what counted for that, and slightly different ways in which these different offenses were uh, punished. And so a thought was coming up with some kind of looking to what the criminal codes were, how the different states were sentencing people, and trying to come up with a more rationalized view uh, that makes best sense of what people are doing to have a, 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 better, a better code, a more consistent code, so you didn't have these uh, any, more, any greater disparities between states, you're going to get disparities between states, we're all alive to what these are. Um, but not any more greater than they were at that time. Anyway, and it's been something that's been largely adopted, for those who care, I don't know how many in the room there will be, um, in England and Wales. Um, so England and Wales adopted a version of the Model Penal Code, um, in both in sentencing and in criminal uh, uh, law practice. And Scotland, uh, right now, has a Scottish uh, sentencing commission which is currently implementing the first sentencing code in Scotland you, having uh, regard to multiple purposes for sentencing like you have in the model penal code. Point of the story here is the model penal code talks about self-defense in law between Albert and Betty and others and it's about necessity. It's about self-defense is only warranted, uh, it's only justified where I am under an immediate emergency, where I am under an immediate threat, where I need to do something, I cannot wait to phone the police, I don't have time to get uh, rescue, then it could be okay, and then it is only okay as a defense, <coughs> a defense for prosecution. You're not allowed to hurt and kill people, you just won't be prosecuted. You have a right to not be prosecuted. Um, by on, on the grounds that you have this necessity uh, justification, otherwise known as duress. I give you three examples from the UK. Why? Because you probably don't know them. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the, the last one might be familiar, but I'll come to the last one last. The Tony Martin case, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. Tony Martin was a farmer. He had a property that was regularly being burgled um, by local vandals. He had bottles in the window, people kept taking them or something like this. I don't know quite what, the, what was so interesting about the bottles or what was in the bottles, genies, whiskey, I don't know what it was. But anyway, Tony Martin had a, had a gun. And one day, he surprised the two youths who tried to uh, steal from him. He broke down his door and he shot at them. And he hit one of them in the leg as the person's back was to him running the other way. <coughs> While the tabloid press was very firmly on the side of Tony Martin and his right to defend his property and the laws of England are gone mad and all the rest of it, Tony Martin got in a lot of trouble and Tony Martin was sent to prison. He was sent to prison because despite saying, hey look, I had self-defense, they were in my property, I was just trying to protect myself, the court said, yeah, and he shot somebody from in the back, more or less, as they were running away from you. That immediacy, that emergency situation, that necessity, that duress was not there. Everyone gets the fear that that person felt. The court had a lot of sympathy with the situation that person was in and that a lot of people, if they had a gun, would have probably grabbed one to try to scare that person <coughs> off. So lots of sympathy with Tony Martin. And he got, I think, the lightest sentence possible for that conviction on the grounds of people having a lot of sympathy with what he was doing. But there's a very high bar for when you can do self-defense, but with potential lethal force, with someone else, certainly on an interpersonal uh, level, and if you're going away from you, and you're the victim, this is, note, Tony Martin would have been okay if the offender, the person breaking into the property, was looking at him, was coming at him, was still in that dwelling, when he was still in that emergency, immediate situation. That changed, even though he was entitled to do it at a certain point, that point exhausted uh, when the person went the other way. I know, as an aside, that with McMahon and company, the bare fact that somebody has done something making them liable to defensive force doesn't seem to have any time constraints. They don't say, oh, and then after three months, it goes away now. You don't, uh, you know, that they forget about it, that attack didn't happen, they didn't really cross in the Crimea. That might be controversial territory, uh, another, but not, not for me, um, uh, and so on. But uh, you know, and so now it's okay now. Uh, there's a time limit to what necessity means 
it does, and, and, and it can exhaust, and it did exhaust when the uh, attackers went away from Tony Martin. Munir and Tucker Hussein is another case, um, and, and more heroin. So Tony was, was in harm as such, I mean, other than a, a terrible fright and a very deep and unpleasant experience I wouldn't want to have myself, and I don't think anyone else would. But Munir Tucker had something much, much worse. In that case, there was an attacker who came into their home. The attacker took um, the husband, tied him up at an upstairs room, and then proceeded downstairs to attack his wife. While he was hearing this, he was able to free himself from being tied up however he was tied up. He escaped out of the house, contacted a cousin or uncle. This is the England now, it's not uh, America. Gets a cricket bat. You know, baseball bats are in supply, there's not many of them. Got a cricket bat, came back, and attacked the person who did this, dragging him out of the house and hitting him so hard in the head that he opened up his skull and gave him very severe brain damage. Hussein also got into a lot of trouble uh, over this case. And what was noted here was that he was under this immediate necessity condition. He did have to rest. He could have been attacking him back when inside the house. Indeed, if to get out of the house, had to go past the attacker, he would be fully entitled and it would have been okay. But this would have been justified self-defense. What made it not justified self-defense is that having left the property, having no longer been under immediacy, under himself, himself under mercy, even though he had been, and even though his most cherished and beloved was absolutely, in fact, under immediate threats and problems and all emergency, all the rest of it. He was not. And the court said, you know, you are not to be taking this into your own hands. When you came back, you came back as a third party. And in dragging the person from the property, taking them outside of the house, the person was no longer threatening anyone inside the house for the activity, and so was convicted of, I think, grievous bodily harm, um, and so on. God, I believe, the most minor uh, ascendance possible, because lots of sympathy for how rational people would respond to these kinds of situations, but was a criminal uh, conviction. Um, and so in both these cases, Tony would have been okay if still under immediacy, but that, that stopped when the immediacy went somewhere else. In the Hussein case, the husband was uh, very much able to respond with, uh, with a very severe force and could have used that cricket bat and could have done uh, uh, very severely uh, to the person. That would have all been okay. But what changed it was that the emergency situation was no longer there and came back in a different, uh, came back in the case as a, in a, um, as a third party. Now we have lots of exceptions that are worked into how the law works, rightly so, for lots of good reasons. And one of them would be in England um, how domestic violence cases uh, work. So um, it was a long standing problem that if, uh, it, it, was, it was highlighted, how the self defense laws are very much linked to how one used to be, a certain pastime, chivalry way of gentlemen having disagreements. So self-defense was two blokes squaring up, and if the back was turned, that was no longer under duress and necessity, as I've already said more than once. And so when it comes to the case of domestic violence, of women attacking uh, men in self-defense, the thought was, for a time, it was prosecuted. It was prosecuted at the time because it was not seen as self-defense, because um, in that case, the person, it wasn't face-to-face -face confrontation, immediate, and so on. In law, in England and Wales, domestic violence and self-defense is uh, how it works, is that there must be proven some uh, period of time where there is some type of violence that goes on to that person. Um, of course, this is still has lots of problems, because at least in England, I can only talk for that country, I, can't, I don't know the stats as well here, but typically uh, the police won't have a case reported unless there's been at least 30 incidents of violence that has happened uh, to a woman um, already. But there has to be some type of, of history, and then it couldn't be seen. Then it is an acceptable um, defense. Note that that departure from how self-defense works, however much it might and does with mine, meet with um, intuitive plausibility, is still nothing like how self-defense is working in the McMahon and Fro and Kwong uh, cases. So um, none of these, um, they're all very different uh, from the other cases. They would see, um, in a sense, I suppose they all would be 
um, acceptable to do self-defense, and they wouldn't be able to um, uh, get right, uh, I think, or, 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 or um, really uh, capture the necessity justification, this, this, this uh, sense of duress, that is a key part about how self-defense actually does work. I think not only in law, but I think also um, intuitively. Next slide, I'm going to be wrapping it up shortly. So I'm going to do this slide and close after this. So one uh, of many uh, ways of, of moving uh, forward here, so part of the, uh, uh, my, my uh, problem here with how just war is being uh, thought of, is that just war is being thought about uh, how folks can be uh, uh, morally liable to attack from others, instead of thinking about uh, how I think self-defense is, that self-defense is a kind of defense against criminal prosecution, it is a type of excuse. One of many examples, um, this, this is perhaps as controversial as the Crimea invasion uh, uh, case, uh, or was it democratic takeover, um, I leave it to others, is Kant and the two shipwrecked men sharing a plank case. So this is one, right, where the, the ship is wrecked, um, two people are on a plank, if they both hang on, they sink and both drown. What happens if one pushes the other off? And the thought is that, the, that doing that was not punishable, but it's also not praiseworthy. It's not great. It's not, hey, high five, you, you've just let someone drown in the ocean. You're not something you're proud of, you're not something you're happy about. I think emotion, sentiments that I think are ones that are shared by those who have been doing self-defense. There are things that they feel absolutely justified in what they've done, absolutely, 100% in the, the fear and so on. But boy, they wish they were never in this situation. And the, only, and the only thing that is justified is that getting out of that emergency situation is proportionate to ending the emergency against themselves. It's not taking the attack further. Okay, great, now I'm justified to attack back. I'll do it in proportion to something else. No, it's only proportionate in self-defense to stop the immediacy of an attack against a victim, not about third parties kicking in and doing their thing. Self-defense is proven by the defendant. It's not about the attacker. The attacker's actions may have relevance, but we may look to the defendant's liability, not the attacker's. And we use a subjective test about reasonable beliefs that a person uh, has. Uh, these are the different types of uh, defenses in, uh, in English and Welsh law, with duress being the one I think most relevant uh, to thinking about uh, self-defense. So if there is a case of self-defense that is present, then it makes unpunishable what might otherwise be criminal. It says that this action would be criminal but for certain excusing conditions. Infancy is being under the age of 10 years old, or the medicine would be something like operating unknowingly under the influence of, of some type of, of drug or uh, some other type of medical condition. Duress is the immediate uh, sense of threat and so on. Mineral coercion is a very curious one that is um, more or less ended now with, the, with what is back home, a, a famous case involving a Liberal Democrat member of Parliament, um, where um, it, it's basically where a, it only applies to married women, it doesn't apply to anyone else, and it's where the married woman says that it was her married husband who, made, who was insistent that she um, do some criminal act, and that's, that's why she shouldn't be punished. Uh, for uh, doing it. It was famous because it was a member of parliament who was a very rising star in the coalition government uh, shortly after 2010 uh, in, in Britain. Um, Chris Hewn was his name and um, he had basically been outed as having um, these stories are sometimes more, well, hopefully not more interesting than my talk, but I say it anyway. He had been outed for having um, a lover by one of the Sunday papers. Immediately left his wife uh, to be with her and she claimed um, uh, and, and to get revenge on him, uh, she said, ah, well I took points, speeding points for you in traffic violations that would have seen him uh, have his driver's license removed and an awful lot of trouble, be kicked out of the cab, wouldn't be in government anymore, basically. But he, she said, oh, it was me driving the car to save his ministerial career. She now says, oh, that wa uh, wasn't me. I can prove I was somewhere else. You're in a lot of trouble. And don't send me to jail, judge, because I'm going to do the marital coercion. Uh, thing. But her name was Vicki Price. She was a very prominent <laughs> economist who was regularly on TV and, TV and advised the government. It was deemed 
to not be the kind of person that was easily intimidated by anyone, <laughs> let alone her husband. Um, and so the marital coercion defense is more or less gone. So a bit of history about that, but, uh, what that is. But again, I just want to highlight this point about how we often uh, think about self-defense. And I don't think this idea of self-defense is unique to English common law. I think this is something I think that's also some intuitive attractions, that the kinds of things that we can do self-defense about, about harming somebody, um, is about our subjective mind. Um, it's about what we are thinking at the time, the sense of duress that we have. The standard case of the police officer gets a phone call somewhere about gunshots, goes out to that place, and accidentally shoots someone uh, who they mistake to having a gun. That that person care who was actually holding a piano stick, a real case. Um, a piano leg. Don't ask me why people are walking around with piano legs and bags, but that was, that was the situation. Um, that the person with the bag wasn't threatening anybody in fact or in fiction, that there was no actual threat is in a sense almost neither here nor there. What matters is the reasonable belief of the person so acting um, and the duress that, that person had and whether or, not that, um, whether or not that sense of duress meets a suitably high standard by us or uh, not. It doesn't matter so much about the attacker when we think about self-defense in cases of actual self-defense. And when we're doing self-defense, we're talking about it as a defense to something that we would otherwise punish them for, rather than, um, rather than they're doing something good. We are just simply excusing them from a prosecution. I'm going to leave it there. I have another uh, slide. I'm looking at the clock. I'm very mindful. I can go ahead anyway. We'll show. I've got two more uh, left. Uh, thank you, I think. So I'm only going to note this um, concern without saying much more uh, about it. That just where theories are largely built on analogies of two or three individuals that they then build up uh, from uh, from there. Um, I like philosophy and I like analogies. I have no problem in particular with analogies. But one of the issues with using analogies of of people representing countries to then make some comments about how you can draw some lines for, I'm going to say these words, I'm in New York, President Trump making determinations about when to go to war or not. Um, you know, there should be some health warnings about the limitations of using these types of analogies that, to my mind, are absolutely never made by any of the leading political theorists, philosophers using these examples. So lots of talk about the people doing things without much talk about how this actually relates to groups and why uh, we're applying it to groups can and should uh, matter. That puts us, that's in addition to misapplying self-defense, necessity defense, um, in relation to international uh, law, uh, relating to immediate emergency of states, such as to an actual or perceived actual unjustified harm, and the, un the inability to call on others um, for uh, help. And of course, when it comes to international law, self-defense is one of many uh, different types of causes there could be to justify some type of military um, intervention. Nonetheless, again, those cases are more like duress and so wrongful but unpunishable in the international sphere related to groups as well as individuals. So I'm only making a very brief throwaway point that, I, um, uh, that there's this mistake of individuals for groups, but the, the deeper philosophical point about duress and the importance of duress, the importance of emergency, the importance of victims might be have some type of right, but then other, others being able to, third parties being involved, uh, works a, a different way, I think, uh, than um, McMahon and company have, um, have defended. I just want to kind of point that as a further concern uh, I have with their example. So the final slide, now that I've only flagged, however unsatisfactorily, uh, another thing. I want to kind of go back to my, my main concern. So just war is typically justified now as a form of self-defense. I say now um, self-defense has always been a, a, a part of just war uh, thinking for um, perhaps as for as long as there's been just war uh, thinking. But a particular way that self-defense has come to be part of the just war tradition, uh, which owes its origins, I think, to Jeff McMahon's revolutionary uh, work, and one I think that is fairly uncontroversial amongst um, most people writing about self-defense in just war uh, today. I think it fails to account for essential features of self-defenses. There's no right as such uh, to self-defense. It's a lack of emergency. 
focusing on attacker's uh, status instead of defender's intentions is a, is, a, is a flip, I think, in the opposite direction to where things mm -hmm. actually are. I've not gone into anything about legal moralism. All I mean by that throwaway comment, the throwaway bullet point, is that there's an awful lot here about our being able to effectively punish, harm others, on account to their moral liability for things. And I just want to draw a big, uh, and put a great big question mark, that um, what we can punish doesn't necessarily map onto what is immoral or what uh, there is moral liability for. I just want to kind of flag that as a general point, but I don't want to argue for that uh, now. I probably shouldn't have had that as a bullet point at the end, but I just flagged that up as a further concern. A just war so conceived is not justified, it is excused. Our defense only kicks in where we might be otherwise subject to sanction. Difference is not a matter of indifference if we act permissibly, but we do what we otherwise should not be done, and so requires a higher test for uh, validity. And so I think that the just war accounts have to do one of two things. You either have to realize that the kind of argument they're trying to run with, focusing on the attacker's status, is something different than self-defense. It's a different type of uh, justificatory argument and run with it as that and don't call it self-defense. Um, or they need to revise their account to something uh, like, I think, the, um, to how we actually do uh, think, think about uh, self-defense and actually do uh, act on uh, self-defense uh, in law and practice as well, so those are some thoughts. I hope it was suitably controversial. Um, I'll look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, Professor Brooks will take your questions. I forgot to note that um, two things, as usual, as you, most of you know, this is going to be followed by a reception in the Ralph Bunch Institute. And second of all, I wanted to acknowledge and thank the uh, the social and political philosophy working group for co-sponsoring mm, and some of them will be questioners, I'm sure. So. Thanks, Will. It's okay to be convinced. <laughs> uh, Josh. So, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I think I'm actually mostly convinced, but I, I have Good some, some niggling <laughs> <laughs> doubts. Um, one. I'm a little bit worried about the idea that there's no condition about oneself because condition one of McMahon's um, thing is about the aim, right? Which seems like it is about your intention in defending yourself, right? So like there is this sort of strong reference, I would think in McMahon's theory, um, to the intention that you have in defending yourself um, and that it has to be sort of appropriate. Uh, to the use of military force. So you might think that that covers analogies like the um, Tony uh, mm -hmm. Martin case, right? Like that it was his intention at the end wasn't to defend himself, it was to, to pay these people back for what they'd done to him or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so that's not an aim that justifies the use of force. And mm -hmm. so similarly, you know, if I, my, you know, if one country imposes, you know, strict military penalties on another country, their aim is no longer just, and so they wouldn't qualify to be able to claim just war under McMahon's theory, and that that is about their intention. So I just wonder what you think about that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, so one, one initial thought is, um, sure, so part of the aim is to justify myself and, and defending my, myself um, from, uh, a, 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 and, uh, we'll call it an unjustified attack, however we want to think that would be, whatever that would um, look like. I think then, you know, if we, so charitable response to McMahon would say, okay, well, if so, there's then, um, he, he does see himself as trying to prescribe, to limit the conditions of just war. So, so to be very clear about McMahon, because he's, he's, I hope after this broadcast, is still a good friend of mine. Um, you know, Jeff is not for war, right? So Jeff is very much not for war. He doesn't think war is very bad. He, sees himself as trying to bring clarity, I think he is, in uh, how we philosophically reflect about the just war tradition. I think he makes lots of uh, uh, benefits, just not the, the, this, this particular key one. Um, and, um, and so he does see himself as trying to limit 
what those cases of a just war might look like from others. At least that's where I, I think very much this project's uh, trying to go. So the thought of, of uh, my, my charitable, what I take to be a charitable response to him, you know, he'd be happy with my saying, oh, well then he needs an even more limited uh, uh, view, he'd be okay. I think he likes the sound of it being more limited. But for a reason he hasn't foreseen, and I think it's about that time relative nature, so to speak, that um, the fact that, that, that uh, to have that interest, that interest is very high, right? It's under that immediate threat, emergency to myself. So I've got a very strong interest of doing something, but it only exists at a particular point in time. It's not something that lingers. And quite notably, if we run with, if we think that my characterization of, of I know that I'm talking about English law, but we think that his thought about duress and, 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 and self-defense sounds all right, even if it wasn't uh, uh, scribbled down uh, somewhere in our, uh, our, our code book, um, then um, this immediacy is something that he hasn't thought of. It's not my, my being uh, uh, on his uh, ability of, of duress to, to do self-defense under any condition is not something that I can uh, pass over to someone else. So the fact that I am under threat doesn't mean that you can kind of pop in, hey, Tom seems preoccupied, um, I'm going to go in and I'm going to do something uh, for him. So if, uh, if we want to kind of offer these kind of intuitions and so on, then I think that there's still a lot of uh, revision to his cat that needs to offer. And I'd say he doesn't, I mean, even, even still, the main point of action is in the, the status, the responsibility. This is the debate, whether it's a responsibility or status view of the attacker uh, between, we'll call it the McCann, McMahon camp and the, roughly speaking, the Kwong camp. Um, that the action is on the attacker's responsibility for getting themselves in a situation or that they've transformed their status and walking around with the flag saying, hi, I'm morally liable to be attacked by somebody else. Um, that's where the, the action is. It has nothing to do with the mindset of others. And I think there's probably an, an implicit assumption that they will just want to attack because wouldn't you? But I think that makes an implicit bias uh, um, about what people would think would be. I was just at the Metropolitan Met and I walked through the exhibit of the Shakers. They would they would deny uh, uh, this. Uh, you should be attacking back. Some defense is not what you do. Violence is always wrong. It's not just Buddhists. Uh, Alice. So, uh, um, I thought it was thanks for the talk by the way. Uh, I thought. The analogies you draw to the legal code about self-defense were really pertinent to this. One thing that strikes me, though, is that in systems of self-defense in criminal law, we normally think of something like either proximity or mm -hmm. legal police action as being able to end the threat. Mm -hmm. Therefore, your self-defense action doesn't rarely needs to go all the way to lethal force yeah. or, you know, as uh, as in the case of the folks leaving the home, presumptively, although considering their last name, I wonder if the police would have been super fast to respond, but mm -hmm. you can imagine in a, in a better world they would. But in the international situation, you don't have those kinds of safeguards. And so I wonder if the self the self-defense just war camp might say, Look, yes, it begins at self-defense, but because those other things don't come into play, there's no police, you don't stop being neighboring countries, mm -hmm. it just has to go farther because there is no other step. Mm -hmm. The threat is just not, you know, ever neutralized in, in that way. Excellent. That's wonderful. So, great. So, uh, thank you for your comment. So, if there is, say, no police to call upon, I'm putting aside the question of the Security Council. There's no police to uh, call upon in the international realm. Um, and, there's, and this proximity might work in the one case, but doesn't work in the other. Then what does this mean? It means that the analogy is just really bad. They're thinking about two people having a self-defense kind of thing, in addition to whatever the other reasons I have. And I'm very happy to accept other reasons for why my position is correct. Very happy to take lots more reasons. It's excellent. Um, then there's even more reasons to say that whatever they're doing, whatever they're engaged in, it's a, it's a, it's a theory, it's a view about the liability, you know, uh, about forfeiture of rights kind of view and how that might play into things. And let it stand or fall on those types of merits. That might be all right. Don't say this moral liability stuff is actually about self-defense 
and it's actually built upon how you and I or some of the two other people might interact in some type of similar space because lots of things are, are different. Putting aside the individuals and, and state stuff, which I think is an important distinction, um, that, that you know, they go a step too far and the analogy just really is unhelpful. All, all analogies will pick out certain features. All analogies try to highlight certain things to test their intuitions, but some are a stretch too far and they're trying to read far too much in, from, from this uh, to where they want to go. Uh, but I say this as well, that your, one thing that your police action points out is that yes, so the thought is that in the individual uh, case of, of self-defense, Tony Martin case and so on, and that other case of the Usain's, that in these cases that yes, I might as a private individual, as a lone actor as it were, I can interact, I can be involved as the victim, or when, I'm un, when I am the victim under immediate duress. One notable kind of complete departure here is that for McMahon, Kwong, Fro, and company, um, people don't have to be victims to be jumping in. In fact, most of the people and, and most of the examples aren't victims. They're everybody else who all of a sudden are walking around waiting to see who's liable for attack and they can then jump in, whoever they are, wherever they are from, uh, to do this because you have an unjust aggressor who's done something terrible and so has uh, earmarked themselves out in that, that way. So you have something very uh, uh, different in that respect. In another respect, with the police, the police, of course, represents a type of legitimate authority for want of a, this is my, I'm not trying to spin uh, your thoughts uh, too far, but, um, but it represents something like that, a neutral kind of ground, some other thing that we can appeal to. Um, that would be something, you know, if, if this is really about self-defense, you might think it's not just that someone has made themselves liable to attack, but those who can do the attacking, unless they are themselves under the immediate emergency situation, should be some type of legitimate authority, whatever that would be, some sanction of some kind, some extra legitimacy that would give a green light to this, as if they were the police. If I'm not uh, acting for the state because the state can't come help me under my immediate attack, uh, then um, you might think they could work the analogy that there are others who come to the rescue or acting as if they're police. But that's not part of the account. That's not what they are doing. And that would then be another thing. It's either why the analogy is just a terrible one, and one doesn't really uh, get as far as they want, or they need to uh, rethink um, what either revise what self-defense self is uh, in their account, or go to something else, scrap it all together. But couldn't you come back? Good. I, I'm not sure you fully addressed his uh, challenge. Okay. Because if all implies can, mm -hmm. the reality in international affairs is mm -hmm. that there is no, I mean, the Security Council maybe could in principle decide something, but it doesn't have a peacemaking force at sure. its disposal. So given, I mean, wasn't his question that given the absence of a legitimate authority to which you could appeal? Wouldn't that work perhaps in, in favor of the McMahon point of view that somebody should do something kind of would be the idea? That, so that was I kind of one thing I was thinking, like thinking of the Husseins. If we imagine, you know, they're sure the police aren't going to come to their help. Yeah. We might think that, okay, the law is what it is, but we might think morally those guys are well within their bounds to go in and rescue their family member. You know, if they're really confident, there's no way to bring in legitimate authority. So, yeah, these folks might make that same kind of claim. Nobody's coming to your rescue. Mm. There's a lawless situation mm. in which there might not be a legal mm. uh, analogy. Yeah. There might be a moral analogy to mm. the kind of self-defense and even, you know, care for relevant others sort of uh, mm. moral defense. Although I. I did, um, I did enjoy the, the part of your answer. I think my question kind of could split off into more than one direction. Sure. No, this is good. So, I mean, I think what are the peacemaking operations? Well, under self-defense, it's not about making peace. It's not about punishing. It's about stopping the immediate emergency situation. It's about stopping that aggression. What happens next is something that's a different kind of process. You know, the someone must do something. is about someone must do something about the unjustified aggression to stop this kind of harm happening. What happens next is given to a different 
uh, process. Um, so with people, with individuals, there might be the self-defense kind of stuff that we've talked about, but then in my self-defending myself, it might be trying to restrain someone, so only using proportion, only uh, doing what I must do to get myself extracted from the situation. Perhaps at most, I might make a citizen's arrest of, of some kind, of hold someone until uh, others can come uh, help. But help isn't, okay, great, we've got them. Let's go kill everyone who was involved in the uh, unjust uh, aggression, whoever they are, wherever we find them. No, no, obviously not. No, 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 and you've clarified it very well. Um, no, absolutely right. That, that's not what we would uh, want to say uh, for a moment. There would be stopping the immediate harm, and then there'd be a separate process of thinking about what justice demands from, from, from here on in. But it isn't a, a tale of uh, trying to add more harms. Harms are always wrong. They can just sometimes be excused. Uh, yeah, I guess I have a... Thank you. Uh, two uh, two questions. Or if I should ask them both. Ask one. Yes, three if you want. Okay. That's fine. Uh, oh no, no, sorry. The chair is the chair is in charge. I'm, you don't know uh, David. Under these cases. <laughs> Each is in five parts. Yeah. Uh, all right. First of all, I wonder if one of your objections is that these just war theories focus on the status of the attacker instead of the intentions of the defendant. But I don't think that applies to all just war theories. Yeah. It just applies to maybe the modern ones. But yeah. especially the older just war theories, one of the important requirements is that the intentions of the defender are good. Um, and there's various ways of patching that, that out, right? That you know they don't go above and beyond, that they're not having fun or whatever, that they're you know, doing only what's necessary, yeah. right? And while that has been dropped, I think, for most of the modern theories, especially the older theories, that was quite an important part of the theory. Um, and I guess the second question I had was sort of based off of what Alex was talking about. Um, I wonder if your, your viewpoint of self-defense is a little too limited okay. in a sort of legalistic sense, whereas you know, there seems to be this sort of you know, broader moral idea of self-defense. Like especially like in a state of nature or like an anarchic situation, right? Where um, you know even if there's no immediate danger to myself, if I have if I justifiably if I justifiably believe that this other person is going to attack me in the near future, there seems to be a moral case where you know if the police aren't going to stop me, I have a moral case of like you know protecting myself through this preemptive action which is sort of similar, more similar to the just war case than like the strict legalistic definition of self-defense. I'll go backwards. Um, excellent. No, thank you very much. I like them both. So if you, if you have a justified belief about uh, doing something, uh, even if not true, um, actually wouldn't depart from um, my um, understanding about what you could do or uh, no. Now, I'm not going to stray, at least I don't want to stray if I don't have to, into doing preventative uh, attacks and uh, preemptive attacks and Donald Rumsfeld. I want to keep that to, I'm standing like Donald Trump, so he doesn't like to sit, he always stands at his desk. I don't think, he says it helps him think, I think he could do something else to think better, but that's fine. Um, but putting that to the side, um, this is okay, because the view of self-defense that I'm talking about, one I think that is, uh, not only intuitive, but one that is legalistic, to borrow uh, a, 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 a word here, um, is one that is about the beliefs of the subjective belief, state of mind, of the person who is doing the defensive action. What constitutes whether or not it's a defensive action is about whether or not that person, not the rest of the world, has some um, uh, be justified belief about, in, in, in England, uh, what's called a reasonable belief, is a reasonable person standard, um, uh, about that action. So it might be the case that someone, it, 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 well, there are cases where someone has used lethal force against somebody who posed no threat whatsoever uh, to that person, um, but there was deemed a reasonable belief uh, for that person in that situation, and, and it's looking at the subjective mindset of the person who did the action. It's not looking at the other uh, side. So if we think this is the, the right moral uh, view, we all just, you know, this is the right kind of moral position, wh whoever we are, wherever, whatever framework, Hegelians, Kantians, and others, millions coming together, one broad happy family, uh, fine. Then, then you're right, I agree, and that's the view. And all of it is different from that. So it's all a big, you know, so when they're talking about self-defense, Maybe there's something else that's very attractive to it, but it's nothing, it's very different. It's different in content and character and everything else 
from the type of moral justified self-defense that you, that you and at least I am, am talking about. So I think that, that um, if that's an objection, it sounds more like a friend. The other point is excellent. So um, you know, one, I suppose, implicit part of my point is I noted that there was this tradition of the past, and things have kind of had this rash, uh, this kind of very big break from it. And but perhaps there's some bits that we should come back to. Uh, you know, that there might be a revise uh, of some bits. So um, I'm, I'm wary about what it means to be a suitably just government uh, under the old uh, uh, criteria. But you're right that it was very important that the defender had kind of good intentions in the, in the action. So it wasn't just having a just cause and doing it in a just way, but having a certain kind of frame of mind and engaging the activity. There's five, I think, different criteria for uh, thinking about just war under the old We'll call it the old uh, theory that has been swept aside by uh, to some degree, uh, of course, by Walter, but certainly by um, McMahon. And I think that that um, is a bad thing. That um, you know the mindset of the defender was something that was taken very uh, as as very essential to thinking about just war in the good old days. They were well, they weren't so good, but they were certainly old. Um, and um, self-defense was a part of it, but it wasn't the only thing that they were justifying. So it's. This idea about it, good intentions of the defender um, wasn't just of defenders, it was also for others who were involved in a just uh, war. And that might be something we want to bring uh, back. So, in, in having a revolutionary break from the tradition, it's not necessarily bringing the tradition forward. I will reflect deeply on that uh, later, uh, later today. Thank you. And uh, John Kwan. Hi, I was wondering about um, the case of domestic violence. Yes. As a case of self defense. So you might think, well, here's a case, it's interpersonal, but maybe it causes you to rethink like, what you mean by emergency or need is a necessity mm -hmm. when it comes to self-defense. And so why couldn't you make a similar move when defending these kinds of just war theaters and say, well, look, like, when you think about self-defense on the international level, there's additional like, uh, moves you have to make to uh, sh see why we'll immediacy necessity maybe needs to be expanded or emergency needs to be expanded or a different kind of a notion or something like that. Um, and so maybe more generally the idea is, well, look, you bring up all these cases of self-defense, how it's understood um, within a state, mm -hmm. like within this legal code, code interpersonally. Um, and you're saying, well, it's not sort of applicable, it's a disanalogy. But why couldn't the just right there say, right, it is a disanalogy. That's mm -hmm. why it's like a special case of self-defense on the interpersonal level. And like this concept of self-defense here that you're talking about doesn't apply to this international. Just like maybe it doesn't apply to the domestic case of self-defense or needs to be modified or rethought. And so mm -hmm. um, the international kind of self-defense that they're talking about, it's still self-defense. They're all sort of like species of the same genus that self-defense. And you're talking about a very specific species. They, they might agree, they might just agree with you. Like, well, yeah, you're always this analogy, right? So this concept of self-defense here is inapplicable, but that doesn't necessarily show that the concept of self-defense they want to argue for mm -hmm. on the international level isn't the right concept to use, right? Sure, no, excellent. So, yeah, so either the accounts of just war as self-defense need to be revised was my first of my two-ish Conclusions, mm -hmm. and I think that's what you maybe are, are hinting at. So, if they want to make that claim, okay, yes. How everybody else thinks about just war for just about every other type of case all works this kind of way. We we understand and we accept a certain type of a different type of, of self defense. How that might work in the case of domestic violence. We're just doing something something altogether different from all other cases of, of self defense, such as interpersonal. Uh, relations on the international level. If they want to make that argument, then I'm saying make it. The point is that they're not. And this is a problem because the analogies, you know, the arguments they're making are about usually two or three people involved in self defense, drawing um, uh, an awful lot out of how two people interact and saying that what happens on that local individualized level is directly analogous to what happens on the state level, that there is no difference between what's going on the individual level and the state. I've argued that one of the big problems, I, uh, one of the things I, I, I've not liked uh, very much, I've not appreciated uh, in, in making this move is that there's, we make analogies all the time, we make, uh, you know, to draw lots of very important distinctions. Nonetheless, 
there's no awareness that there is a difference between thinking about individuals interacting on an individual level versus thinking about states in some type of um, Westphalian way um, as groups of like people interacting, bumping up against each other. There's no kind of anal no type of acknowledgement that the international is any different from the interpersonal. And I think to make that jump to say it's a different type of thing from how we normally think of self-defense, it's a different type of thing like we see with domestic violence, they'd have to say that they recognize that different type of category. There is something different about self-defense on this level. Um, and so a different type of enterprise. So either they need to revise it and then say why this is a new species of self-defense that we just haven't thought about as self-defense in other types of cases, or they need to realize that the way that self-defense works isn't how they say. I'm more inclined to go with the latter, but that would be my response if they wanted to push them first. Uh, Hugo. I, I offer up a, sort of a different take on this, perhaps. I would caution you, just as somebody developing this theory, about discarding the relationship or the analogy of individuals and nations too quickly. Okay. Uh, they are the result of a lot of you know, intellectual thinking and development over centuries that has sought to make groups of people responsible mm -hmm. for their actions as a group. I know a lot of people despise the latest uh, Supreme Court ruling that allows corporations to act as individuals when they fund political parties, but the whole reason for treating a corporation as an individual was so that it could be responsible for the actions of mm -hmm. its employees, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. respondeat superior, <laughs> and recipe solo couture, and all of those pieces that uh, developed over centuries of law that said, we're going to call this corporation a person so they could be sued as a person for their actions of their employees. Same thing with a, the, the country that is acting as a single unit when it puts an army in the field, right? Mm -hmm. So that, what is the mens rea of the country that's doing the attacking? Is he, as uh, just was brought up, anticipating some else, somebody else's attack and therefore it's justifiably preempting that attack? Well, that's a mens rea question, right? Mm -hmm. Don't be too fast to throw those aside mm -hmm. without understanding why they were derived in the first place. Sure, no, I, I, I have my criticisms of mm -hmm. uh, uh, corporate persons and, and so on. I, I put to one side, you know, um, I'm, despite being a, a proud son of New Haven, Connecticut area, um, that I know a lot more about a different jurisdiction that's not on this continent than I do this one uh, these days. But, um, but, but say overseas, uh, when it comes to uh, offenses like corporate manslaughter, um, so that's kind of thinking about punishing um, a, a group, a collective. And the way that's done in thinking about the mens rea is thinking about the operating officers that are responsible for decisions there. So there's particular people that, that, that get involved. And um, one of the things that one of my students is working through right now is that um, in thinking about the punishment of corporations, that um, you have that kind of talk as if you're doing things with people, but yet you're lacking the full range of stuff that you do with people. So when it comes to punishing corporations in England and Wales, how does it work? Uh, do they get time in prison? No. Do, can they be hung? Uh, well, not anymore. That, that, end, that ended a while ago. But you can't do that quite. It's all purely financial penalties. And this is, of course, fine, uh, you know, absolutely fascinating. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a punishment sense, because in the, I'm stepping, making a couple moves away, but I'm going to come back to your point, that in the philosophy of punishment, there's been this kind of debate over whether penalties should be, when we talk about punishments, are penalties even there? Um, so for fine penalties or not, uh, monetary fines, whatever size, are part of what punishment is. Punishment is something else. It's about hard treatment of one kind or another. And so in thinking about the punishment of corporations that's only penalties under our standard, which I reject, read my book why, read, uh, reject the, um, you know, I, I reject the standard way of understanding how expressivism and so on uh, works as a theory. Well, penalties is, is not even part of the, 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 the scene, um, so to speak. So that's all kind of as an aside. I think that I don't have to, though, disagree, I mean, for argument's sake, with my key point, which is not about groups and people as such, right? So even if groups had, uh, I won't call it personality, but even if we could use analogies like individuals, 
it makes good sense, looks Brooks wake, Brooks wake up, there's a good reason why this is the case, and so it fulfills good purposes. Say I accept uh, all that. Even if I do, my objection to what's going on with McMahon and company still stands because um, you know we can still count the groups as uh, people acting, interacting like people. But then it's not a different type of, of, of thing. Um, it's it's to be you know we are to think about it as we do individuals. We're, if we're to treat them like individuals, and we treat them like individuals, and how they're thinking about self-defense is very far from how we morally and I would argue legally, certainly legally, uh, treat uh, individuals. And so even if I you know I I, I uh, draw the that that one slide a common concern about groups and individuals, which which I which I do have. Um, it doesn't deflect the main point. So I'm, so I'm then comfortable. But more about restitution than, than uh, punishment. Sure, yeah. Well, that, that, that's right. I mean, that, that's right. And so, so my student, Reem Rodney is her name. Look out for her in a couple of years, everyone in New York. Um, give her a job. Um, she uh, is trying to think about restorative justice for uh, corporations. So there's all this talk about punishing. One about RJ for companies and how would that work? And well, she's still working. When she figures that out, she'll, she'll deserve everything. Okay. Well, we also have some people working on what's wrong with the person who you can give them a job. I look what indeed. Yes, I'm happy to reciprocate okay. and have that on tape. Yes, that's okay. right. Okay. Big fan of Cooney. This is just an observation, mm. but you know, in a decade or so, right at the end of the Cold War and right after the Cold War. Mm. A lot of time was spent developing the theory of responsibility to protect. Mm. And it just seems that that idea is not so different from the idea that um, there's domestic violence and mm -hmm. a neighbor hears it and comes in and tries to do something. Um, it turns out that R2P has all kinds of unintended consequences and has fallen in some disrepute these days. Mm -hmm. But I wonder how that fits in with some of your ideas of what the might be just for us. Then I need to be very careful and very brief but about what I say. Yeah, I'm, I will nonetheless be very that. ginger in how yeah. I uh, try to and gentle about what I do here. You're right, so responsibility to protect is, is fascinating and very good. And I think, you know, um, for a lot of the folks who take this view that I'm criticizing, Responsibly to protect is something that they all sign up to in one guise or another, and it makes good sense because, in effect, that's to some degree what they are talking about. Um, and perhaps thinking about responsibility to protect um, the vulnerable, those who are under attack, maybe a way of thinking about it could be that folks are making themselves morally liable to attack and virtually forfeiting their rights because of something naughty, terrible that they've done. I mean. All I will say about this, with the full knowledge of what is in this building, uh, both in spirit and Hegelians care about the spirit, um, as well as the as, as the as the as the structure, um, is that that is something different from self-defense as such, right? So there's the the thought except, about what I can defend myself. Except that it initially some of the really initial work on R2P before there was even R2P mm -hmm. came out of the idea that. If you had, if you were um, killing and slaughtering people within your borders, mm -hmm. you were likely to release refugees into neighboring countries, thereby in causing harm to yourself, which gave you a right of self-defense. That was very early days before there was such a thing as r Right. Um, what would I say about this? Well, I think that it would be. Um, I think that the justification for R2P is still, I think, a little bit different. I mean, it might be that in the early days it had a, a certain uh, type of view. Likewise, let me let me run with a different analogy. So I've already said the words restorative justice. Restorative justice started off as abolitionism. I remember at first when I read about the abolitionists, I wondered, punishment? Um, and, and they were, of course, for the abolition of the prison. They thought that there shouldn't be use of prison. Now, um, the restorative justice crowd does the thing a bit different. The arguments are, are a bit uh, nuanced, and there's an acceptance that there's some areas where prison can be okay, just they want to use it as little as possible. They're not so much the abolitionists 
as they are the use it as little as possibleists mm -hmm. uh, 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 crowd. And I think you know maybe there was there was a, perhaps a move then, as you suggest, that might be in the early days the RTP uh, crowd might be something. Um, uh, similar to this was uh, self-defense stuff, but I think that they have moved quite a, oh, far beyond that now. Definitely. And talking about more activist interventions oh, yeah. elsewhere on humanitarian Excellent. grounds, for which I have enormous sympathy for mm -hmm. a lot of the things that may be justified under these grounds, although it mm -hmm. is very controversial and so on. But I think it strays from um, the self-defense stuff, and that's what I want to draw attention to. I have just one question. I'm, could you um, discuss a little what your inclination is in terms of which mm -hmm whether, uh, you know, what also the practical import would be of your critique. Do you have an idea how it would apply to just war theory constructively, and either in their own terms or the way you would want to develop it? Wow, that's the... just dump that whole account of self-defense and return to the you know, classical views, or what kind of inclination? So there's a two-part question. Yes. What do you have to say about the revision of self-defense? You know, clearly they shouldn't, they should not use the individual um, of this try to dual options mm -hmm. for a second, you, you wouldn't advocate. Um, or, you know, they should be regarded right. as inapplicable, but then they have to work on part one. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's, they can resuscitate it somehow? Or are you just recommending they completely uh, chuck it and with the view to practical, just work through it? What would you say? Because you've well, done a very good critical job. And sort of so what's the positive what's project? The important? Yeah, no, that's right. Um, so, so very good. I think that's um, where am I uh, going um, with this? So if my critical account is successful, what does success mean? What does success uh, look like? Um, it, is, it is this. There's been, I think, an industry built on the view of just war as a type of self-defense, where the action is, yes, we all know it's self-defense, <laughs> based on individuals, and we're going to have these kind of very long arguments as to when someone is liable to be uh, morally liable to attack or not, based upon um, this responsibility view that they've set, them set, set, set something in motion. So for McMahon, I can be I can be someone uh, morally liable to attack by others, even if I'm innocent, because my taking responsibility, for taking a certain type of risk, can make me. Uh, and, and that my doing something, I, I, I drive a conscientious driver of a car going down a road, I do everything I can, but the, but the car just fails despite all of my best efforts, and I come towards someone else and I can be killed. For him, that's okay, because I took the responsibility of, of taking that risk and driving cars and so on. That's one view. They get very excited about that. Nothing about the person that might be killed uh, and what they're thinking as they have a car approaching them and that analysis. Kwong and company say uh, that I have done something that makes that changes my moral status is what's happening. So for Kwong, the person behind the car who's done nothing wrong isn't something that we are justified in killing and stopping and hurtling towards us, even though it might kill us. It's only those who are, are trying, uh, morally, trying to do something um, uh, bad. So one of the things I'm trying to say is that this cottage industry is built on a mistake that they should recognize. And thinking about just uh, the just war tradition and, and what forms a just cause, it might be that self-defense remains a part of it. It has been a part of it since the start of the just war tradition. War. And that's not a problem. Right. Yeah. You're not trying to... Absolutely not. That. Yeah. No, no. I mean, in a sense, this is why I'm revising uh, 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 just war. The bit I'm against, as it were, you know, this is a, a, this is a, a talk against a particular understanding mm -hmm. of just war. I think that needs to end. Um, and in a sense, the justification, if you're going to run with the self-defense line, for McMahon and others, it can lead to views on rights to protect. It can lead some, uh, James Pattinson, a former student um, at Newcastle, he's done a lot of writing on humanitarian intervention. Uh, it really works best for those cases. It works very well for those cases, and you can get a lot of mileage and so on uh, for those types of cases. Uh, but if you want to do that kind of stuff, that's your project. You're trying to justify it in self-defense. Actually, the self-defense bit, how that might work as a justification, if that is what's doing your work, is actually more narrow than they recognize. And actually, if that's all you're running with, it, it, it doesn't allow you to do half as much uh, as they say you can. Mm -hmm. and, it, and so, um, and justify fewer cases than they say you can. So I do that. That's the positive. Virginia. Um, I have one very small point to start with and then more question. Mm -hmm. uh, the small point is if you're going to be talking about self-defense um, uh, within a legal system uh, at the individual level, 
um, you might, for American audiences, mm -hmm. acknowledge how it can be misused. Oh. And the Trayvon Martin case. I know that you know, case, know yes. About that. And, it can be misused all the time. And, yeah. and Florida has this uh, provision. Stand your ground laws, yes. And many other states would like to have it that don't yeah. already have it. Yes. And so you just might acknowledge those sorts of problems. Um, my, my larger question is, I don't think you said anything about the laws of war, mm -hmm. uh, the kinds of things that, that um, uh, have been very influential, uh, at least within a lot of arguments, um, that uh, one should not <coughs> necessarily kill non-combatants mm -hmm. and once a, a, an enemy soldier, even if, it's, even if he's on an unjust side of the war, once he has, has no more armaments and is, mm -hmm. is um, not any longer a threat, you can't just kill him. Sure. You have to take him prisoner. All those sorts of things that make war a little bit less awful than it might otherwise be mm -hmm. do have a certain standing in um, international law and discussions mm -hmm. and all that. Mm -hmm. So if you take um, McMahon's view that uh, if, if you're on the wrong side of the war, you, you, you aren't entitled to any of these protections. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty serious consequence, and I wonder what you think about it. Well, I think it is a pretty serious consequence. I mean, to, to go in order uh, to some degree, I think you are absolutely right. There's lots of problems indeed. Um, stand your ground uh, is one of many, uh, and people uh, get the uh, get things uh, wrong um, all the time. I'm, I, I'm not so sure. Um, so what I've been trying to say is that the way self-defense uh, works, and I think uh, one that would, uh, we would be favorable to even if it wasn't uh, something that was uh, how belief systems of our countries tend to work, um, is one looking at the subjective mind of the person who is doing the defensive um, action. Um, rather than thinking about the mindset of or the action of the attacker or at least the attacker only with not a consideration for uh, the defender. Of course there are going to be mistakes in terms of getting that subjective mindset right on the defender. Likewise there can be lots of mistakes as to where in the world do we draw the moral liability uh, stuff on the attacker side for which is the debate for it seems quite a few uh, if not everybody uh, writing about just war stuff uh, now. So I think you're absolutely right. I should acknowledge these, these, these problems in, in a longer paper. I, I certainly will. There's lots of health hazards on both sides, uh, so to speak. Um, uh, but they, they, don't, they don't trouble uh, me with my argument. But they uh, but absolutely right that they need to be acknowledged. Likewise, you're also absolutely right. I haven't said anything at all about the international law. There's lots of things about prisoners of war and, and so on and all the rest of it. An enormous amount of stuff. Uh, they're absolutely right. And you're also, of course, you're surely right, makes war a little bit less awful and terrible than it might otherwise uh, be, um, and so on. That's absolutely correct. I suppose what I was going with is that um, with McMahon, Kwong, and, and others, what they're arguing for is, uh, they say, well, yes, we, we'll have a nod to, you know, we're talking about self-defense, and we're going to start with justification on that. And we, we note its use in criminal law and so on, but we're not making legal argument, we're making moral argument. Um, and in making the moral argument, they run with the view of self-defense that seems alien. Not only alien to criminal barristers uh, that I know, but alien it seems to a lot of people who are moral philosophers who just so happen don't work in global justice. And they wonder, well, why do they think that? Um, since when did self-defense not involve emergency to me? When could others jump in um, and, 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 and attack someone who's got a scarlet letter? Uh, on them uh, because, um, because of some action that they might have done or otherwise. So I think that um, you're right that there is a lot of other uh, things, so you know, a, a number of other things that, that come in that may influence uh, the argument. So in terms of what my positive thing might be for where things might go, I think part of that positive answer, what we might build beyond my critical, and my, my, my talk's been critical, uh, as it were, I haven't offered a positive um, contribution as such, um, I think the positive answer has to do something about working within some of that framework, because I do think some of that framework is there for a reason. Um, you know, there are you know, a lot of these rules making war a little bit less terrible than otherwise would be, 
is a good thing for lots of reasons. And we need to then sift through which of the reasons we like best and which ones are most defensible. But um, I would want to have access to that. But, but for here, I just want to only focus on this analogy that they're running about individuals making um, this leap about how self-defense works between people, saying that this has some sort of direct applicability to something that happens um, internationally uh, relating to war, um, which I think is uh, one leap too great. Okay. But I don't disagree with you. Let us continue the discussion over uh, wine and cheese and the Rockland Institute. And please, let's thank uh, Professor Brooks for a wonderful talk. Well, thank you very much.